Right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to day three of LitFest Online in association with the Authors Club. Uh, I'm John Walsh, and I'm delighted to welcome to the Zoom room Andrew Lysett, one of the nation's leading biographers. His detail packed and shrewdly analytical lives of Ian Fleming, Rudyard Kipling, Dylan Thomas, Wilkie Collins, and Arthur Conan Doyle have driven critics to raptures, and his books sell very well because of their bounding humanity. Um, earlier this year, Mr. Lysett published a new work, Conan Doyle's Wide World. Let's give you a little brief of a visual aid, if you can see that in which he introduces and contextualizes the best travel writings of the inventor of Sherlock Holmes. They show Conan Doyle to be a restless and extremely adventurous traveler, at a time when the aristocratic grand tour of Europe was dead and gone, and mass tourism to foreign co uh, continents was still 50 years in the future. From Greenland to Australasia, from an alpine skiing trip in, in 1894 to a zebra stampede in Kenya in 1929, the last year of his life, Doyle never seemed happier than when he was in transit, exploring cities and deserts, interested in everything, always keen to understand human drives and national characteristics. So, Andrew, welcome. What aspect right of Conan Doyle's character or interests were you keen to highlight in your selection of his writings? Well, um, he was a man of great energy, which comes out in his writings. And, um, you know, he was curious about the world. He wanted to find out about things. Um, this is something that was manifest, you know, from his earliest days as a student in Edinburgh, where he studied medicine. Uh, and, um, you know, he wanted to get out there. He wanted to see things. He wanted to uh, write them down, anatomize them. Right, sure. And um, where does his earliest trips outside, the, outside Britain take place? And how many were linked to his interest in photography? Well, uh, he first started traveling as a student doctor, basically. He was, as I said, um, studying in his hometown. He was born there of Edinburgh. And um, it was sort of part of that sort of rigorous, empirical Scottish uh, approach to learning that made him um, very conscious of collecting information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he, he went on um, a sort of, uh, uh, a peer, um, what do you call it, you know, in training uh, while he was studying. And he went uh, to some interesting places. For, um, basically, he, he, he went traveling in the Arctic Sea. That was what he actually did when he was a student. Um, he went on a whaler out of uh, Peterhead, which is sort of um, somewhere just uh, north of Dundee, I believe. And uh, he traveled and he experienced the, um, the solitariness of being uh, out in the, 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 the sort of the, the great Arctic. Um, and he experienced the thrill, there's no way that uh, he would not have used that word, of um, the uh, wailing and um, uh, basically the slaughter of seals. Um, and he wrote about this very uh, uh, methodically, very clinically, very full of great uh, interesting detail. I mean, for example, he starts off one of his essays about it, and there's about three of them uh, that I can think of, that uh, he was um, talking about the, it, how strange it was that there were people on this planet, on, in Great Britain, who hadn't seen uh, corn growing. And that was basically because the uh, sailors, they left Peterhead in February and they didn't come back till September. So this sort of thing that, that he, he liked to note, notice. Um, after uh, that particular journey as a student, he, he, he um, quit, uh, he, he got his degree. And the first thing he did after that, when he was trying to discover, sort of decide what it was that he wanted to do with his life as a medic, was to join another ship as a ship's doctor and to go on an extraordinary voyage down the coast of Africa. So this took him to all the sort of stopping off points, 
starting with the Madeira, uh, Madeira, okay. and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, going down uh, the west coast of Africa um, as far as um, uh, Accra and uh, sort of around the coast into what is now Nigeria. Right. Um, can we mention Sherlock Holmes? It's absolutely fascinating to be reminded in your book that while Doyle started publishing the famous Sherlock Holmes stories in Strand magazine from 1891, only a year and a bit later, in 1892, he was already tired of poor, uh, uh, poor Holmes and wanted to get rid of him. Can you tell us how did he come to choose Switzerland as the place to bump off his great hero? Well, um he was an adventurer which is a word i haven't yet used but you know that was a sense you know he wanted he was interested in in the wide world he was interested in the romance of travel he was also interested i mean it was you know a, a complex approach that he had had to travel that you know it was both the 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 romance the adventure of it and also the accumulation of facts in a very sort of victorian uh way that you might expect of a um you know trainee uh, scottish doctor yeah. um he chose switzerland because um he'd become interested in in skiing he'd been uh shortly after graduating he uh, no a bit later than that actually he, he went to norway with a friend of his jerome k jerome and uh, other member of his family and um he discovered uh that the the Norwegians were into skiing. Uh, he then was invited uh, to um, a conference in Lucerne in Switzerland in 1892. Um, he was going to address uh, something, and it's not something that he really did much of this kind of addressing of conferences of a group that had been gathered together by a magazine called Young Man. And I mean, I don't actually know too much about Young Man, but I, I think it was sort of providing moral uh, uplift for, for, for the youth of Britain. Uh, Conan Doyle did that, and then he went um, trekking, for want of a better word, in the, uh, the neighborhood, um, in the vicinity. And he went to Meringen, he went to the Reichenbach Falls, he went up onto the, passes and etc etc and got a great sense of it um and um he then decided when he wanted to kill off uh, sherlock holmes this would be a good place to do it now why why did he do that why was he fed up with it with sherlock holmes after such a short period it's not really a travel story or anything like that it's just a story about conan doyle really because he um he didn't he thought Sherlock Holmes was kind of trivial stuff and he wanted to write a sort of proper proper literature he wanted to write a historical novel he wanted to write something like he actually did the white company but he wanted you know to write others that would be uh, greatly um, admired and so he decided that you know he was wasting his time with Sherlock Holmes um, he then went back to Switzerland after the death of Sherlock Holmes. He, his wife, um, Louise, uh, contracted tuberculosis and he was looking for um, sort of healthy places that uh, uh, he could take her. And he, he went, like a lot of people, to Davos in, in, in Switzerland. And he began uh, skiing there and you know going on skiing treks he it is claimed sometimes even by him that he introduced skis to to switzerland but of course that's ridiculous because um that had always been done but he did i think it is probably true to say he did popularize the idea of, of skiing in mm. britain yes it is rather a cheeky um uh, claim to make that he single-handedly brought skis to, to switzerland but he's um what, what other predictions did he make about the future of travel? So he did have some brilliant ideas that you bring out in the book. Yeah, I mean, he was innovative in his in his thinking, and you know, he was he was interested in flying. I mean, for example, I mean that existed more or less, um, you know, in his infancy. But he was one of the first people to go to Heston Aerodrome and to get in a plane and go up. Uh, and he wrote about this. He wrote a sort of fantasy about um, flying up you know further than you could possibly go it up in the skies um he was interested in more sort of prosaically you could say in um 
joining Britain to the to the continent. Channel and Tunnel. So he was an early advocate of, of the Channel Tunnel, and he wrote yeah. letters uh, to the Times about this, as he did about other things that he was interested in, such as, you know, he thought that he he could invent a type of armor armor for tanks and all this kind of thing. Amazing! Wow. Um, he seems, Conan Doyle seems to have been remarkably keen on war and scenes of war and the excitement of uh, going into action. He traveled to Ypres and Verdun during the First World War. He was part of the campaign against the Mahdi and he was involved in the Boer War as a medic. Could you, could you tell us what, what, you le what we could learn about his passion for being in the thick of conflict? Where did this come from? It was part of his desire for adventure. Now, um, you know, the best example of this I can give actually is when he was visiting uh, Egypt in the mid 1890s. Uh, and um, again, this was sort of one of the things that he was doing to, to take his wife to sort of, uh, you know, sunny climbs. Um, and at the time, Britain was just girding itself for one of those wars against the Mahdi in Sudan. And he immediately abandoned his wife um, and uh, he signed up as a, as a correspondent um, for a newspaper and uh, he, he joined the sort of um, the military uh, um, press corps and he traveled with uh, Wolsey's army and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, he was also, um, he also did interesting uh, trips with his wife and they went up, up the Nile. Uh, and it led him to write what I think is one of, um, well, it's a very interesting book that he wrote, that wrote The Tragedy of uh, Karosko, uh, which was a, a place in Upper, Upper Egypt, uh, where he, as a result of his experiences, etc., he uh, fantasized that a group of tourists had been kidnapped by uh, the Mahdi's um, men. Um, and I've, I've, I may, may have written this, I can't remember, but I, I, I feel that this is the, probably the first novel by a British um, writer about Islamic fundamentalism. Oh uh, and that's, you know, that's an example of his forward thinking, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Yes, a hundred years before, you know, the, the satanic verses, let's say, yeah. Um, he was terribly impressed with America, or mostly impressed with America. Um, his su the superlatives, superlatives abounded. Um, San Francisco, the finest city in the world. The people in the streets of New York, he said, were offered the finest spectacle in America because of their uh, teeming optimism and their big smiles and, uh, and uh, gung-ho attitude. And in Washington, he goes into raptures about the Lincoln Memorial and the Capitol. What did he most admire? And most dislike about the US? Gosh. Um, Sorry, it's a huge question, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, he took it as it as it came. Sorry, that's a bit of a cop-out as an answer. But, you know, he, he, he was very interested in the cities. I mean, he actually visited, had visited America in 1894, which in parentheses was um, my starting off point for writing about him because uh, he'd gone to visit um, somebody he didn't actually know, but who was living there at the time, Roger Kipling, and they played a game of golf uh, uh, on the, the, um, uh, the land outside Kipling's house there in Brattleboro, Vermont. Anyway, he'd been there in 1894. He came back in 1914, just before the, um, the um, First World War. And he, he liked comparing how uh, New York had changed and he liked to think that it it had changed for the better um, but he he was very interested in you know what, what was going on in the in the cities as, as you pointed out but he was also perhaps loved even more the great wide open spaces of America so he loved it I mean he, you know he was in raptures about going to to the Rockies you know that he did it both in the United, in the United States and in Canada. Um, just again, one more thing to say there is that actually, it's probably his favorite place in the United States was San Francisco. Um, and he loved the way that um, you know, it was laid out. He loved being able to get out to Sausalito. He liked getting out in, into the hills. Um, you know, that was his, his dream city. It had always been 
you know, dream of his, and it, it didn't let him down. Yeah. The one thing he really didn't like about uh, America was chewing gum. He said, uh, right. to quote him, he said, Venus would look vulgar if she chewed, and Shakespeare a lout. There was, ne there was never so hopelessly undignified a custom. Um, <laughs> That's right. But also, he's, he also said that, um, you know, it was just a passing fad, like snuff, basically. Yes. And that, yes. you know. <laughs> Speculation, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, sir. and of course, but these, he loved um, he loved the Rockies and the wide open spaces, just as he loved the deserts in uh, in Egypt. Right. He loved yeah. the Rift Valley. He was he was almost beyond words of delight. But he also loved you know national parks and the taming of the wilderness. Um, I wonder is there any contradiction there between somebody who loves mad extremes of nature and putting them all into a, something resembling something more manageable like a park. Yeah, I mean these were pretty damn big parks. Really. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think that, I don't know, you know, he, he was, I mean, one of the things that he, when he was traveling, particularly in Canada and also actually in Australia and a bit, a bit when he was in Africa, was that he was interested in how um, um, the local people, and uh, let's be honest, you know, he was talking mainly about the sort of people of, uh, British descent, you know, who who were there, uh, how they were coping with farming, you know, what was the optimal holding, you know, should it be 150 acres or something like that, you know, what they were doing with um, this and, you know, how they were developing it. And, you know, it was part of a, a, a sort of quasi, well, more than just quasi, it was part of a, a sort of colonialist uh, sensibility that you know he he wanted to make sure that these places and okay america was no longer part of british empire but canada was and and um, and so of course was australia and um so you know he wanted to make sure that these were going to develop and they will be economically self-sufficient you know which seemed to be important to him sure um in the last year uh in the last years of his life, um, when he was traveling a lot in Africa, he was he was very keen. He's very keen in, the, in his writings to show off learning. I mean, ornithology, botany, zoology. He's always spotting. Oh, look! There are some Thompson gazelles over there, and some Kongongi deer over there, and it's all like you know. I know all this stuff already. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also archaeology. He, he can identify Nankin Chinese plates and Venetian glass. Just so, but in passing, he discourses on civilizations in this airy manner. Would you call him a polymath or just a snapper up of facts to bulk out his writing? Uh, he. I, I kind of bulk at the idea of polymath um, somehow or other, but he was he was more than a snapper up of, of facts. You know, he was somebody who was interested in, in everything. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, he wasn't perhaps the greatest intellectual or anything like that, but, you know, he was interested in everything. He'd, he'd written, he'd read widely. I mean, you know, um, I refer in, in my book uh, to his um, his you know his interest in in travel books and you know he yeah. read you know scott on the antarctic and a whole range of sort of travel books and actually extends you know he's it's a book about his library and so it's all yeah. about the things that he's interested in apart from travel books as well yeah i was very impressed to see that his um more or less his favorite travel writer was um uh, was darwin and uh, the voyage of the beagle um, yeah can you tell us what he admired about about darwin well, I think it, you know, it was it was the sort of things that um, he himself was interested in. Um, that you know, he was interested in. I mean, you know, I can read you something that he wrote. I mean, if if you're Go for it, absolutely. Um, you know. and he wrote of Darwin and the voyage of the Beagle. Nothing was too small and nothing too great for its alert observation. One page is occupied in the analysis of some peculiarity in the web of a minute spider while the next deals with the evidence for the subsidence of a continent and the extinction of a myriad animals. And his sweep of knowledge was so great, botany, geology, zoology, each lending its corroborative aid to the other. And, right. you know, that was uh, Darwin in the words of Conan Doyle. It was also Conan Doyle. It's a bit self-identifying there, I think. Yes, yes, so yep. I'm, I'm similar. Um, we're coming to the end now, I'm afraid. Could I just ask you about some... Um, um, in his younger days, he was sceptical about uh, anything to do with the paranormal, but after 1916, he went lecturing 
everywhere promoting the cause of spiritualism. Um, what's happened to change his mind and what were these tours like? Um, interesting question. Uh, basically, he always had a sort of sense of something beyond. Um, and he kind of, as he was this trained scientist, he sort of kept that um, under wraps. You know, he was one of those people who were a member of the Society for Psychical Research, the sort of scientists who looked into the paranormal, etc. Uh, but he didn't allow himself to kind of put his head over the parapet. But, you know, with the First World War and the loss of members of his family and those of his wife, second wife, Jean, um, you know, he just, he, he basically decided that this was, he was going to become a spiritual, a fully, full blown spiritualist. And he, my God, uh, you know, Conan Doyle being Conan Doyle, he, he then went the full hog, you know, and so a lot of his subsequent travels are going on tours as, um, a sort of spiritualist ambassador to Australia and et cetera, et cetera, and also to, to the United States. To an audience of bereaved people hoping to get in touch, maybe? Would that be it? Who, is, who were his audiences? Um, they were people who, you know, they came obviously for a variety of reasons, but, uh, you know, a lot of it was under a sort of spiritualist banner. And, and so he got large audiences, um, huge audiences for yeah. his talks. Yeah, for a man. I'm afraid that's absolutely all we have time for. Our 20 minutes is up. Um, this is an absolute feast of a book, ladies and gentlemen, crammed with vivid and excited notations about the, the world at the turn of the 20th century from a man who was thrilled by the variety of countries, civilizations, and people he came across. And congratulations to Andrew Lyser for putting the book together so well. And thank you, Andrew, for telling us about it so entertainingly today. And goodbye. Thank you, John.